Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. The battle for the Republican nomination appears to have ended, but a different struggle over the nature of conservatism rages on. Which ideas will flourish in the Republican Party? Which vision might capture the imagination of Americans? Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Christopher DeMuth, President of the American Enterprise Institute and Chief of the Deregulation Activity in the Reagan Administration. John Judas, Senior Editor of The New Republic and author of William F. Buckley, Patron Saint of the Conservatives. David Brooks, Senior Editor of The Weekly Standard and Editor of Upward and Backward, The New Conservative Writings. And Bill Kaufman, author of America First, Its History, Culture, and Politics. The topic before this house, the heart and soul of conservatism. This week on Think Tank. Conservatives have been on a long roller coaster ride in the Republican Party. In 1960, conservatives had to fight hard even to get a seat at the table. We are conservatives. This great Republican Party is our historic house. This is our home. Let's grow up, conservatives. Let's, if we want to take this party back, and I think we can someday, let's get to work. And work they did. By 1980, under the banner of Ronald Reagan, the GOP became a predominantly conservative party. Reagan balanced a three-legged coalition of economic conservatives, social conservatives, and anti-communists. But when Bill Clinton won the 1992 presidential election, the roller coaster plummeted. Some conservatives feared that their movement had wilted before it had fully blossomed. But in 1994, not just Republicans, but mostly conservative Republicans were richly rewarded at the polls. More recently, conservatives were brought low again. First, their contract with America was stalled by President Clinton's veto pen. Then came the spectacle of a self-inflicted bloodbath during their primaries earlier this year. You should run for governor of Washington or wherever you live, and then you'd have that kind of experience. Well, Lamar, the Japanese do not practice fee and fair trade. Well, and if you believe that, Ma Lamar, we're ready. I don't know what you smoke down there in Tennessee. Well, you voted for tax increases across the board. Not rate increases. Now, no, now, no, now, no, now, don't, now don't, Senator, now Senator. Don't malign my integrity here. Well, uh, it's a typical Washington game oh, yeah. where you say you, you're, you're against taxes, yet you uh, sometimes vote for tax cuts. When no one's looking, you vote for tax increases. Still, Republicans may be just one election away from winning the whole shooting match, the White House, the Congress, the governors and state legislatures, along with a sympathetic Supreme Court. What a time to have an identity crisis. Today there are supply siders and budget balancers, social conservatives and economic conservatives, country clubbers, Bible belters, libertarians, paleoconservatives, neoconservatives, opportunity society conservatives and civil society conservatives, internationalists and isolationists, bootstrap conservatives, compassionate conservatives, Main Street conservatives, Wall Street conservatives. Funny thing is, each faction expects to run the show. First question, gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Uh, Christopher DeMuth, what are we talking about? What is conservatism as you see it? If conservatism is any one thing today, it is anti-governmentism. It's the repository of all of the hostility and di distrust that many Americans feel toward big government for many different reasons. And it's the glue that holds together the social conservatives and the economic conservatives. David Brooks. I'd say the glue is the common idea that something was lost in the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and we should go back and rediscover what was lost. The differences between conservatism is when it was lost. The 1950s, the 1920s, the 1860s, those are the differences. Okay. Uh, John Judas. I don't think you have a conservatism now that, uh, that, that unites every one of the different factions. That, and I, I'd say that the main two right now are a kind of pro-business Tory conservatism based in uh, Washington and a, a more populist, nationalist, uh, socially conservative, uh, socially conservative conservatism that's based outside the Beltway. Okay, 
Uh, Bill Kaufman. Uh, I don't think I'm a conservative of any stripe, actually. Uh, what I am, and I don't think I fit into the conservative movement, is a Jeffersonian, uh, an upstate New York regionalist, and an isolationist, uh, a believer in an America of small, self-governing communities and regions uh, with maximum amount of personal liberty and a minimum amount of interference from Washington and New York. Your book is called America First. Uh, that is Pat Buchanan's slogan. Uh, did you support the general tenor of the Buchanan movement? Uh, <clears throat> to some extent. I, I think what, uh, uh, what Buchananism showed, and uh, we owe him a debt, uh, is that uh, uh, essentially there is no conservative movement anymore. We've seen over the last five, six years this interesting coalescing uh, time and again on major issues, NAFTA, GATT, the Mexican bailout, the Gulf War, radical campaign reform. We find people like, B populists like Buchanan, uh, Ross Perot, uh, Jerry Brown, who ran a very significant campaign in 92, coming together in what is always referred to as a strange alliance. Well, at some point, I think uh, this becomes a natural alliance. And the glue that holds these people together, I think, is a belief that decision making ought to be, ought always to be at the most local and decentralized level possible. Look, you know, that, that's what Chris was saying. Uh, it was anti big government, and yet you right. would not agree with uh, staying out of the Gulf War and uh, doing all the things that Bill Kaufman just talked about. That, that's correct. Uh, there are many different factions in conservatism today in the Republican Party. Uh, and what conservatism will become, I think, will be defined by practical events at this point. The New Deal coalition was made up of Dixiecrats and blacks and unionists uh, and uh, many groups that had many deeply conflicting interests. It came to stand for security, which in the context of the Great Depression was enough, providing social security, and that idea became the glue that held that party together and helped them smooth over many, many differences. Now, if the Republicans, a conservative Republican Party, uh, should uh, uh, gain a lasting, durable political coalition, what conservatism becomes will be defined by the particular events that come up and the decisions that are made. Uh, conservatism in America for the past 30 years has been an opposition uh, movement. The New Deal lasted a long time. Simply being against big government could last for a long time. The only thing the Republicans have dismantled so far is the Interstate Commerce Commission. It's 100 years old, so in a my sense take, they have 100 years of work to do. John Judas, what do you think about that? Is this movement lacking uh, something it favors? I think you saw that during the Bush years. I mean, the, part of the problem in the Bush years was the end of the Cold War, we, and the Cold War had been the, the essential unifying point uh, for all conservatives. But I think what you also saw in the Bush years was just the problem you're posing, uh, what to do, what to do, what a constructive conservatism uh, would look like. And you saw, saw the beginning of these kind of lo looming splits uh, between a kind of business and populism, questions about trade that are emerged in the, in the first Buchanan campaign uh, in, in 92, questions about lobbyists. A lot of the, the Washington conservatives are, in effect, lobbyists. And we should have had that in our list, the lobbying conservatives. <laughs> Absolutely. The, 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 the case, so, K Street conservatives. God, i got to write that. I, I think that's right. I think conservatism has a problem defining itself as a, as a, a positive movement, and it functions best when uh, there's an opponent. David, you hang your hat uh, at the Weekly Standard, which is a conservative standard bearer. A lot of, lot of young conservatives, people we used to call baby cons. Uh, they went through this, that, as you described, this enormous victory and elation after 1994. Ha have, have these young idealistic conservatives uh, sort of been deflated as some of the sanctimony uh, kind of... Uh, oh, we haven't lost our sanctimony. We haven't we lost the sanctimony. Uh, <laughs> no, a, right, right. I think what you have seen is something radical. Up until now, that, at least in my lifetime... That's a renewable resource, right? Yeah, yeah, no, right. yeah we've right. got a bottomless pit. Right. Uh, uh, up until now, political and, and philosophic will, wisdom came with being on the cutting edge. Always go further, never compromise. Bush compromised in 1990, that was a problem. So not, in this Congress, the philosophy was never compromise. Always be on the cutting edge. Well, that was a mistake. They should have compromised. So suddenly you have to rearrange your entire political instincts. Instead of thinking, always be on the cutting edge, always be brave, compromise is a failure of courage, 
suddenly you, have, you do have to think differently about politics. We're, you know, we're also breathing free air for the first time in, in, in many years, and it's a heady sensation. Uh, conservatives, uh, uh, most conservatives, were attached to uh, what I would call the politics of empire for half a century. And there was a sort of bipartisan consensus at elite levels that just suffocated uh, any debate over America's role in the world. I, I think what we're seeing now is a split into uh, defenders of the empire, defenders of sort of centralized control, and people who recognize, uh, in the words of the great Kentucky poet, farmer, uh, Wendell Berry, who is, uh, uh, I think, a leading light of uh, this sort of new coalition, uh, that the great danger in this country is, is from the placelessness of powerful people. I mean, what, what uh, does that mean, placeless? Well, let me, let me, I'll, I'll talk about populism for a second it, as an example. Uh, it has a good side and a bad side. The good part of populism is when it's grounded in the particular. Uh, Henry, James, uh, Henry James' character had a line, patriotism like charity begins at home. Uh, a good populism is that, uh, you know, William Jennings Bryan in his Cross of Gold speech said, ours is not a war of conquest, it is a war in defense of our homes, our families, our freedoms, our communities. On the other hand, when you have a sort of a populism of, of rootless people, the sort of you know, deracinated uh, uh, you know, operatives, uh, what you end up getting is you know, scapegoating of, of immigrants or Jews or things like that. Or you get an entirely phony and factitious populism of the new Gingrich sort. I, it's, I think it's, uh, uh, it's illustrative that uh, Gingrich in graduate school is said to have uh, responded to someone when asked, where are you from? I'm from nowhere. Uh, that's, that's very dangerous. We need people who are from places, people who want to defend those places, and people whose politics and way of looking at the world comes from those places. D John, un unlike uh, David Brooks, you hang your head at the New Republic, which is sort of a liberal magazine, although it's, it varies from issue to issue. A a as you see the recent developments in conservatism, uh, are, uh, are liberals and se semi-liberals and uh, saying, aha, it's about time those guys got shot down and they were too big for their britches and it's really all over? Or are people noting that after all, Clinton has moved enormously uh, and, and even the democratic rhetoric, no one is going around saying, let's raise taxes, let's have more government? Both. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, you have to separate questions about Republicans and Democrats from questions about liberals right. and conservatives. The, you know, the, the question about the Republicans is different from the question about conservatives, but they're similar in a way because in, after the 94 election, there was this tremendous eu euphoria and this feeling that a realignment had occurred, a euphoria at least among uh, conservatives and Republicans. And I think both, among both camps now, there's much more of a, uh, a dawning realism that what happened was a tremendous change took place in the South, that it was long overdue in effect, that we have a two-party system and it's probably tilted toward the Republicans. But as far as the rest of the country, it's really up for grabs. I think that the <clears throat> there are going to be people that call themselves conservatives yeah. uh, that have very, very different views on what government ought to do in the future. But I think if it is to be a successful political movement as a governing majority, it's going to have to decide what it thinks of the idea of progress. I think political movements take root in America if they identify themselves with core political ideals that are widely shared. And the most widely shared ideals in America are liberty, equality, and progress. I think the Republicans, the conservatives, are generally on the right side of the liberty and equality issues today and the Democrats, liberals, are starting to realize that. But Republicans are very ambivalent about progress. Uh, uh, David talked about uh, recapturing what was lost in the 60s or 70s. Uh, uh, Bill would like to uh, return to a, a much more stable, rooted uh, society. That's a different, very different view of the future than the supply side, tax cut, deregulators, uh, that are in another intellectual wing of the party. That would be the wing that you feel most comfortable with. Uh, I, I feel comfort with, with both wings. I'm a little bit like Bill. I, I think that there are many opportunities for uh, fusion here. But I think a fusion has to be worked. I think that those who are uh, social conservatives, 
that are primarily uh, fed up with government because of lousy schools, violent crime, undermining the family, and so forth. I think those ideas have to be attached to some vision of the future rather than simply be an attack on crummy present policies. All right. Uh, Chris Demuth, you, you mentioned the idea of uh, fusion and what would happen uh, in terms of, of a new government. Let's, let's play a little game here. I'll be President Dole. In the election, uh, Dole was elected, a Republican Senate and House was retained. You guys, I'm the president, you're my cabinet, you're my major advisors. I say, okay guys, what do we do? I, I think one should start with uh, fundamental tax reform, entitlement spending reform, and deregulation, simply because those are the, those are the big things that the federal government does today that are causing the most social harm. Mr. Okay. Mr. Secretary, what, yeah, what do you I'd be propose? the Secretary of Education, and right. after calling for the elimination of my agency, I'd <laughs> ask the President Dole to talk about school choice. Uh, as a wise man once wrote, values matter most. Yes, people, sir, right. uh, Shameless <laughs> uh, people care about cultural and moral decline. The, what most conservatives care most about is remoralizing society. And through school choice, what you can do is unleash several different approaches in communities around the country of people trying to come up with ways to enculturate young people, to introduce a common culture that they and their communities can share with their children. In America, we re remoralize society through education. And so I think that's, that's what you should do first. All right, Mr. M Mr. Secretary Kaufman. Uh, I'll tell you, you won't listen. I would uh, <laughs> dismantle the, uh, the empire. I'd slash the war budget. I'd bring the troops home. I'd abolish the vast majority of uh, federal programs. I'd knock down most of the edifices in Washington. And I'd devolve uh, uh, power to where it ought to reside, in communities, and in individuals, in neighborhoods. And I think what you'd have then, and what is one of my great interests, would be uh, a cultural uh, reflowering of, uh, of the American regions. I mean, one of the great, our great enemy today is, is this homogeneity, you know, that's in, you know, with Billings, Montana, and, uh, uh, Northern Virginia have, have far too much in common. I mean, I'm in favor of, of individuated places and particularistic cultures. And we're not going to get this until we, uh, uh, you know, until we bulldoze uh, uh, Leviathan and, uh, and return power to uh, the most that, local that, level possible. Right. I'd like to point out an interesting uh, difference between, uh, to me, between Bill and uh, David. I like very much the idea of school choice. I said a moment ago that I thought that conservative would flower if it got itself behind the idea of progress. I think that poor public schooling is something that is enormously uh, uh, irritating, agitating uh, to people across the political spectrum and economic spectrum. It is an issue that unites the different wings of the, con of the uh, Republican Party, and it's got the Republicans on the right side of, the, of progress. Uh, uh, liberating people from the public school systems, letting them choose and improve the uh, education of their children is something that is broadly popular and that the Democratic Party has got itself in an odd political position where it has to resist. So I would be in favor of this, sitting around with you, President-elect uh, Dole, making this, an Dole, I've already been uh, <laughs> uh, make, making this an important part of your first administration. But Bill would not. Bill would say, School policy ought to be done at the local level, whether it is public schools or vouchers or how we finance it. Washington shouldn't have anything to say about that. And the idea of a national school choice program led by some national tax policies or requirements on the local level, Bill, who's a good conservative too, would find anathema. He doesn't want, he doesn't want President Dole having anything to do with it. It should be pointed out the debate we're seeing here is a reenactment of something that happened in the 40s and 50s. Uh, the conservatism of that era was the America First conservatism, very regional, uh, very isolationist. Bill Buckley and others came in and redefined conservatism and according to uh, some of the, those who came before, ruthlessly purged uh, the previous sorts of conservatives. And Buckley and I think most conservatives since have stood up for national empire, if you want to use the word, but national greatness, national problems, at the same time devolving power away from government, shrinking the size of government, but not denying that we as a nation are, we are importantly a nation, that our problems have to be solved nationally. Th this strikes me more as a late 19th century controversy uh, and the early progressives versus the later. Because I think that what, I think it really is very hard to go home again in the sense that 
that uh, the economy itself is structured in such a way as to make that kind of localism in, uh, impossible. I think that there has to be some counterweight nationally and statewide to uh, the, the large private economic units. This, this the is question is that we're going to have <coughs> is how to do it, what right. to do it, whether deregulation is yeah. the course, what to, yeah. I mean, how. Let me just say, this is not a, primarily a country of small communities. This is a primarily a country of opportunity. My great-grandfather lived in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a very tight, very model community, newspapers, religion, everything. Yeah. As soon as he made some money, he moved out of there because he wanted opportunity. He moved uptown. Yeah. Ever since then, my family and most families in this country have moved for opportunity. And that has destroyed community, and there's something to be lamented about that, but that is just the nature of America. What has also destroyed community, though, John, is the national government. I mean, my hometown, to which I, we returned several years ago, Batavia, New York, where I live, in the 1960s, urban renewal, a federal program, you know, begun by the, the most well-intentioned liberals, came in and destroyed the four-block heart of my downtown. I mean, it wasn't, you know, some sort of rapacious private developer who did this. It was the federal government. I, 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 no I, mean, I don't look, I don't look, I don't look to, to Washington <laughs> as my protector. It, it's a question of how to do it, and it's not just Washington, it's your state government, too. But in fact, a lot of the tendencies of modern life in the 90s are decentralizing. I, I, uh, the big modern corporation is turning out to be much less of a threat to upstate New York than people thought 10 or 20 years ago. The, uh, the structure of the corporation is becoming radically uh, decentralized. Uh, huge layers of central corporate staff are being eliminated. Computer communications technology has made it possible for people to be very, very productive in much smaller economic units uh, than we've had yeah, in the and past. Ally Kaufman's uh, prescription. Well, I, th I, mean. I, think that, I think that there's a lot in, uh, if I may call it, paleoconservatism that is a little bit, uh, uh, it has a romantic view of the past, uh, and that is inconsistent, that is simply not, not in the cards. And it's inconsistent with a lot of the things that make rural life wonderful today. Computers, you know, there are a lot of things that you couldn't have uh, if you had that old-fashioned society. Let's go around the room once quickly uh, and see if each of you can give us a, a brief statement on what you all agree upon and disagree upon. Bill Kaufman. I think uh, uh, Chris and I and perhaps Dave and I agree that uh, the central government is too large and overweening. I think uh, John and I uh, agree on the, uh, the dangers of uh, uh, soulless uh, multinationals and sort of a lobbying class in Washington that uh, is the enemy of the American people. I think the thing we all agree on, and probably which most Americans agree on, is that the mid-century faith in social planning, social science, that you could fine-tune the economy, that you could plan society, I think that's gone. And I think conservatives actually led the charge against that social scientism. Okay. I, uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, David most uh, strongly. And I think, I think that, our, that the challenge for conservatives is going to be uh, to expand, to continue to expand material welfare, widely shared, choice, but also engage the deeper argument, what is this, all of this wealth and choice for? What are we, what are we to do with our freedom? Last question, uh, one word answer, starting with you. Uh, on election day, is it going to happen? Are you going to have an all Republican federal government? Uh, no. Don't know, sorry. Don't know? No, I'd say. You don't know or no? I think probably not. Probably not. Yes. I think the answer is yes. Thank you, Chris DeMuth, Bill Kaufman, David Brooks, and John Judas. And thank you. Please send comments or questions to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. We can also be reached by email at thinktv at aol.com or on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg.
This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.